So Kristen Monaco is the chief economist of the Federal Maritime Commission. Prior positions in the federal government include associate commissioner for compensation and working conditions and senior research economist at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Before working in the federal government, Kristen was a professor of economics at California State University, Long Beach. Her research focuses on issues of economic and statistical measurement and applied work on labor markets, particularly in transportation. She received her PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Okay, go Panthers. Um, and so anyway, uh, after the presentation, Kristen will take your questions. So please have your questions ready. And without any further delay, let's welcome Dr. Kristen Monaco. Good morning. Um, thanks so much for the nice introduction, John. I will point out that John and I um, were in grad school together nearly 30 years ago, um, and I've done all of the aging since then, and clearly he's done none of the aging. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about autonomous trucks and the impact of autonomous trucks on the labor market. As John indicated, I will say that though I'm with the Federal Maritime Commission, my views today do not reflect the opinions of the Federal Maritime Commission. I'm having trouble advancing the slides. There we go, okay, perfect. Um, so the research I'm presenting on today is sort of an amalgamation of two papers, research papers um, from the past. One is on automation and the other is on this idea of a truck driver shortage, um, which has been reported a lot in the press. Um, pandemic. And what I've done for today is sort of take that research, blend it together and update it with more recent data. Um, so the goal, my goal today, um, to get people to think a little more cautiously about what the potential impact of automation on the labor market for truck drivers might, might look like. And a lot of this research has its origins in these headlines that really started appearing about five years ago, right? Headlines like, when the robots take over, what's going to be left? Or are robots going to take over all the supply chain jobs? Attract a lot of attention and get people very interested in these questions, but aren't necessarily, say, the most responsible when at the same time you're trying to convince people to participate in this sort of labor force, right? And so do these headlines, um, are they accurate? Are they sending people the right information about future career paths in these areas? And if not, right, how can we sort of put perspective around that? Um, hopefully I'll highlight some data that data sets that might be interesting to you that are new for you. Um, and then consider how this is going to fit in with this idea of a driver shortage. And so um, I also wanna sell you on why truck drivers are interesting, even if you don't normally think truck drivers are particularly interesting. I've been studying trucking for about for over 25 years now, right? So my entire career has really been spent thinking about truck driving, the industry, the labor market. Um, and so I, don't think that you need to devote the next 25 years of your life to thinking about truck driving. Um, you could, but I think it should be inherently interesting to people who are sort of curious about what's happening in the economy and what's happening with the labor. Um, so obviously I think this generates interest because of just the headlines, right? There's a lot of news and media attention focused on automation that talks a lot about autonomous vehicles. Um, if you have not yet seen videos, right, go on YouTube and look at these videos of these large tractor trailers that are sort of self-driving is super interesting to take a look at, right? The technology is interesting in and of itself. There's lots of truck drivers, right? There's trucks, there's lots of truck drivers, right? The old slogan of the American Trucking Association was, if you got it, a truck brought it, right? Trucks are integral to how we sort of consume goods. And I think that's been made much more clear to people throughout the pandemic. 
Um, and there's interesting measurement issues from an economic perspective. So one of the difficulties that I'll talk a lot about today is if we're trying to figure out how many truck drivers might lose their jobs, the first question is, how many truck drivers are there? And what segments are they in? And that seems like a really obvious question, but there's not a lot of data that speaks specifically to that. So there's some interesting counting issues there. And I think finally, a thing that's interesting to me about truck driving is that the job itself hasn't really changed that much over time. So this idea that autonomous technology could be brought in on these vehicles implies that the job could change markedly in the not too distant future. And so I wanna talk about each of these issues in turn. Um, and to set the stage, when I'm talking about autonomous technology, I'm talking about, I'm gonna use the definition from the Society of Automotive Engineers and sort of the question they ask as they're going through this autonomous technology conversation is they have defined levels zero through five and basically it's changing as you're moving all the way to level five is sort of who's doing the steering acceleration, deceleration. This applies to any vehicle, not just trucks. This applies to cars too, right? So there's probably a number of people who drive a car that has some form of this technology already in place. So you can think of like those backup cameras and alert systems as a form of autonomous technology, right? As you move through this grid, what you're really talking about is, okay, who's in charge of the steering, acceleration, deceleration? Who's in charge of monitoring the environment around them? And then importantly, who's the back? Right. So I'm going to talk specifically about a, autonomous level four technology. And autonomous level four technology means the system is doing the steering, the acceleration, the deceleration. The system is doing the monitoring of the driving environment, what's around me, and the system backup. Level three technology, one step back, has all of those things except the backup is the person. Um, and so there's sort of two a lot about this level three technology. One is that if the person is the backup, then you can't take the person out of the vehicle, right? The person's still involved in some way. So there's fewer labor market impacts. The second is level three technology is like terrifying to me. Um, and I'm has to be terrifying to you. You see these sort of headlines from sort of Tesla, right? Where you have this feature in these Tesla cars where the car is doing the steering, the acceleration, deceleration, the monitoring, but the backup is the person. And if the person is not being attentive, then um, negative safety. Gotcha. Let me turn this off and get rid of that. Okay, so I'm looking at the level four technology because again, that seems to be also where all of the develop it, development and proofs of concept are right now. They sort of skipped from level two technology to level four, mainly because of those safety concerns. Um, so let's talk a little bit about measuring truck drivers because if we wanna understand the impact of implementing level four technology, we also need to say, how many truck drivers are there? And oftentimes when you see these headlines, they propose that there's 3 million truck drivers and 3 million jobs are going to go away. And I'm gonna say that's false for two reasons. One is that there's not 3 million truck drivers um, and then all of them will not be replaced by this technology. Oftentimes when people are looking at headlines on employment numbers, they don't sort of carefully consider what is going into those employment numbers. So I'm going to say that the standard occupational classification for truck driving and um, driving and truck driving jobs is an aggregate category that has three specific breakouts, driver sales workers, heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers and light truck or delivery services drivers. Um, and not all of those are truck driving jobs. And you can see by the examples on this slide that a lot of them are clearly not truck drivers, right? This could include, right, someone driving a, a van who's dropping something off at your house. That's not a truck driver. Um, and it's not to say that these jobs aren't susceptible to this level four technology. It's just to say that these are not the truck drivers who might be susceptible first to this level four technology. Heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers are the only occupation in the standard occupational classification that requires a CDL or a commercial driver's license. So that's going to be my focus. How many heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers are there? There's about 1.8 million. 
Okay, so there's about 3 million across these three occupations. So you get a sense of where they come up with the 3 million in their headlines, but only about 1.8 million of those are the heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers. The other are these light truck delivery drivers and driver sales workers. And again, to also, because economists like to like make an assertion then try to prove it three different ways, I will also persuade you that these other jobs aren't really truck driving jobs because they pay very differently, right? And so if they were particularly similar, you would expect that their wages would be relatively similar. There's not. So I'm going to say 1.8 million truck drivers, and they make on average about $50,000 a year. Um, there are others who want to look at the number of truck drivers who look at industry employment. And again, this is sort of a measurement issue, um, and I'm going to return to this later, but the occupation of truck driving is what we're looking at. The trucking industry does not capture a measure of the number of truck drivers for two reasons. There are people who work in the trucking industry who are not driving trucks, right? So this could be your dispatchers, your managers. Um, and also warehousing workers that support a trucking operation. So an industry definition is based upon what the business is doing at a particular location, not what the actual individual workers are themselves doing for their jobs. And also importantly, there are all sorts of heavy tractor trailer truck drivers who are not employed in the trucking industry. So for example, um, UPS and FedEx are considered courier and express services and they are not in the trucking industry although the trucking industry thinks of themselves as including entities like FedEx and UPS. And it's also the case that many companies have their own fleets of trucks and drivers like Walmart. Um, and they, their primary business, however, is not trucking. So their drivers often are not included in these trucking industry employment numbers. So again, I wanna use the occupational number of 1.8 million, but I'll come back to this idea of trucking industry employment later. So in order to figure out how many truck drivers are going to be affected by this technology and what the, you know, how this might change their job, I want to think about what kind of work truck drivers do. And it might seem obvious that truck drivers drive trucks, which their name implies, but they do a lot of other stuff as well. And I think this is really important to keep in mind. These are not individuals who spend all of their time simply driving a truck. And if automation, of course, is going to impact the act of driving the truck itself, what happens to all of these other job responsibilities? So I want to look into data on what employers are requiring of truck drivers aside from the act of driving, because those are things we need to think about, and specifically what tasks drivers perform. So for, to do this, I'm going to use a data set called the Occupational Requirements Survey. Um, and some of you might be familiar with data sets like ONET. ONET is a data set out of the Department of Labor. The Occupational Requirements Survey is a survey out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's a survey of businesses. So they have collectors who go out to businesses and ask them really detailed questions about jobs at their locations. Um, and this data set actually um, is intended for use by the Social Security Administration. So the Social Security Administration pays for this survey to use in Social Security disability adjudication. But in and of itself, this data set is a really rich set of data that can be used to answer all sorts of other questions because there's questions about the physical requirements of jobs, the environmental conditions of jobs, is the work outdoors, indoors? Do you have to work in high exposed places? All of these things. The education and training requirements of jobs and the mental and cognitive requirements of work. And so most of the results I'm gonna report out from this occupational requirements survey to sort of get a sense of what truck drivers do is based upon the 2021 numbers. So the most recent data that came out. One of the stylized facts about truck drivers is that this is a job that doesn't require a great deal of formal education, which is in fact true. Um, the Occupational Requirements Survey asks questions, what's the minimum level of education required for the job? So this is not the same as asking, how much education do people who work in the job have? This is, as an employer, what's the minimum level of education required for a job? And if you look at heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers, which is the number on the far right, you see basically for them and also transportation workers generally, there's not a lot of formal education required, either no degree or a high school degree. What may also surprise people is that, in fact, for most jobs in the economy, the minimum level of education required is either no degree or a high school degree. 
which makes sense when you consider that some of the single largest jobs in the US economy are things like cashiers, home health aides, and truck drivers, right? These are not jobs that require a great deal of formal education. Even though these jobs don't require a great deal of formal education, it's not to say that you become a truck driver by just walking in one day and climbing in a truck. While there's not formal education required, there's in fact a great deal of what we call specific vocational preparation. And specific vocational preparation includes things like formal education. And we said there's not a lot of formal education required of truck drivers, so that's zeroed out here. Um, licensing and certification, which clearly applies to a truck driving job. You have to have a commercial driver's license. Prior experience that employers are looking for, which is also relevant for truck driving jobs because of the cost of insuring your drivers. Um, over time, companies, in fact, now are really looking for drivers with at least one year of experience because it keeps their insurance costs down. Um, and then any on-the-job training goes into specific vocational preparation. And so the idea here that I want to present to you is that even though these jobs are low formal education jobs, they're not jobs that don't that one enters into fairly quickly, right? There is a process for getting people trained into these jobs and the experience they need to enter the labor force. Um, and that for this job is sort of more than one year up to four years. So that basically, as I said, really for most companies encompasses the time it takes a driver to get the commercial driver's license, but also any training experience and on the job training that's applied. Um, and I think the reason I'm making this point is sort of twofold. One is to, you know, sort of understand the pathway to becoming a truck driver, but also, and we'll talk about this more later, sort of the implication of saying that all these jobs are going away makes people think that they should not undertake this investment to enter the occupation, right? And this is something um, that I'm going to come back to, but I think is important to note. Another set of questions asked about in the occupational requirements survey, again, getting back to this idea of what do truck drivers do, is this idea of who drivers have contact with. So in the original survey, it was sort of what types of contacts do you have with people who are not your coworkers? Um, and the option here, obviously, the dark blue is not applicable, meaning that they don't talk to anyone aside from their coworkers. Um, and it could be structured, very structured, or semi structured. So your semi structured interactions are sort of free flowing where there's not an obvious necessary structure to that conversation. So there's not a fixed set of questions and answers. Um, and the point again here is that if you look at heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers on the right hand side, you see that most of them have at least some contacts, right? And these might be very structured contacts. They tend to be in the realm of sort of customer service interaction, either at the point of pickup or at the point of destination, but these exist, right? So truck drivers clearly do more than drive because there are these interactions, right? There, there are these structured contacts. In the more recent survey, they replaced this idea of what types of contacts you have with, um, are you required to interact with the general public? And 83% of heavy and tractor trailer jobs involve some contact with the general public. So again, something other than driving. The survey also asks about the strength required for the job. And so here I'm just presenting sort of the mode level of strength. Strength is calculated based upon a formula of how much weight you have to lift and carry and how often you have to do it. Um, so again, going back to this idea of driving, driving itself is a relatively sedentary activity. You're not lifting and carrying things. You're sort of sitting there driving. But again, you see that most of these jobs of a heavy tractor trailer truck driver involves a strength level of medium or heavy, again, suggesting that they are doing more than simply operating a vehicle. Um, and I said earlier that this job hadn't really changed much over time, and I know this from a variety of reasons, including the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. And the Dictionary of Occupational Titles is this book that the Department of Labor made up after World War II to try to help people understand career pathways to them. So they basically went through for every job and tried to catalog it and say what's required for this job. And the Dictionary of Occupational Titles went away in the 1990s um, and was last fully updated in the 70s and 80s. So this is really old data on tractor trailer and heavy, tr and heavy truck drivers. And you see under specific vocational preparation, 
used to be between three and six months. It's now longer, again, because of that prior experience required. What strength is involved? Medium strength, the same thing we see today. How do they interact with people? They speak, they signal, they take instructions, um, or they help, right? So all of these things that we're seeing in the current data also hold up in data from 30 to 40 years ago. And then the final thing we sort of do looking at this, so we know that there's some strength involved, we know that there's some interacting with people is sort of say, okay, well, in what context are they doing this, right? What are their tasks? And so in this data set, the data collectors, when they're talking to the establishments that are responding to this, ask them questions. And the questions are sort of, what is this job for, like critical job function? Why do you have this job at your establishment? What do people do in this job? And then what are the key tasks of this job? And that generates a lot of, and what we do here is basically go through and use fairly straightforward sort of language processing software to take these tasks and these critical job functions and put them in two buckets that correspond to the types of things that truck drivers do aside from driving. And so freight handling is obviously one of the major ones. So the majority of these jobs mention that freight handling is required, which we which is sort of what you would expect given what we know about the strength level required of the job, right? So they're handling freight. Um, they're involved in some sort of safety activities. So generally you have to sort of walk around your truck and do a safety inspection before taking it out on the road. So that is something that truck drivers are required to do. Equipment operation here, I don't mean driving the truck. I mean doing some other form of equipment operation. So this could be in the loading or unloading of trucks using things like a pallet jack or a forklift. Customer service, right? This interacting with people and finally paperwork. And again, it's not to say that some of these things can't and shouldn't be automated. I think paperwork is something that can easily be automated. It's still very much the case that in trucking and in other um, modes of freight, there's a lot of actual paperwork as opposed to electronic stuff that goes on. And it could be affected by automation, but not this sort of autonomous vehicle. Um, so what are, so what's the punchline, right? So we know that there's 1.8 million heavy tractor trailer truck drivers. We know that they do trucking things, right? They drive a truck, but they also do things other than driving a truck. And we need to think about that. So what are the potential impacts, again, of this level four technology? So in this level four technology, what is it probably best used for? Um, it's best used for freight that's moving in a box, which basically means not sort of specialized. So you see um, when you're driving down the freeway and there's say someone hauling specialized freight, they might have a flatbed with a bunch of stuff strapped down to it that's like specialized. They might be hauling hazardous materials, right? This isn't box freight. So sort of non-hazmat boxed freight moving via interstates, starting and ending basically close to the freeway. Um, it's less well suited, this technology towards sort of the first and last mile, right? And so sort of think about the activities that the driver's doing at pickup, right? They're making sure the stuff's loaded properly. They're doing the safety inspection. They're interacting with a customer or a supervisor or something of that nature. That's not really automated. You still need a person for that. The last mile is the same thing. Think about the final drop off, whether it's at a warehouse or a business, right? Again, there's that customer service interaction, um, the loading and unloading um, things. And that's not well suited with these autonomous vehicles. It's also the case that most of the very successful pilots of these autonomous vehicles really focuses on driving down roads with limited access, right? And that's sort of a safety and technology issue. It's not well suited for non-containerized freight, um, again, because that's the freight that can most easily become imbalanced and requires more sort of driver attention and skill. And so in a lot of cases, if I said, you know, what we're really looking at is the trade-off between box freight moving long distances and specialized freight moving shorter distances, that would be really similar to classically how we sort of define the trade-off between tr what goes on truck and what goes on rail. Um, and John probably won't like this characterization, but you can think about autonomous trucks as being a really good substitute for rail because there could be a lot of them flowing all of the time in these lanes with this type of freight. Um, so how do we find the number of trucks that meet these characteristics, right? Because I really want to know the number of truck drivers involved in the freight, hand, or the freight movement that meets those criteria. And there's no data set on that. 
but I know that a truck driver drives a truck. So really what I need to know is what are the truck operations that look like that? And the answer is there is not a good current data set on that. Um, the data set I use um, is the Vehicle Inventory and Use Survey. And in the paper and even today, the most recent version of the Vehicle Inventory and Use Survey is from 2002. It is old data. I would say the nicest thing about all the questions that exist around the potential of autonomous vehicles is nobody can answer the question about how many trucks are there that meet certain operational classifications. And so because of that, under the last administration, and including this administration, have rebooted a survey that they discontinued 20 years ago, which, by the way, in federal government almost never happens. Once a survey goes away, it usually goes away forever. So the Vehicle Inventory and Use Survey has been rebooted. Um, they just started collecting data. And as the name suggests, it really is a survey of vehicles. So it's not a survey of businesses and it's not a survey of people. It's a survey of a vehicle, um, which means how many people here drive um, either an SUV or a pickup truck? See, you all could be in the bias. You might get a survey from the census. So it's basically any vehicle on a pickup truck chassis or larger. So the, serve, the, the population, right, the sample frame is any vehicle, pickup truck chassis or larger. And it collects all sorts of characteristics about these. So people are in the bias because of their vehicles. Um, businesses are in the bias also because of their vehicles. And that's what I'm going to use. So admittedly, I'm using very old data, but in the next year, I will have new data to use. And if you all find these questions fascinating. You will have new data to use as, as the bias comes up. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the vehicle inventory and use survey and sort of say how many trucks, how many vehicles in the survey meet these qualifications, understanding that what I'm really trying to think about are the number of tractor trailers driving long distances for trucking companies. So this would be tractor trailers employed in the transportation and warehousing sector going 500 miles or more very seriously or possibly 200 miles or more. So that's what I wanna look at. So I take that distribution from 2002 and sort of split it out in this matrix. And a couple of things to note, which is probably much more obvious to people post pandemic is that most trucks, whether they be tractor trailers or just heavy trucks generally, drive very short distances, right? Most trucking activity actually happens in a radius of 50 miles or less, which again makes sense when you consider the fact that you have major population areas like New York, like Los Angeles, that generate a ton of truck moves that are really local in nature, right? So think about how many trucks move across Manhattan in a given morning to make sure that all the deliveries to the restaurants and the stores happen. So most trucks drive very short distances, which also means that most truck drivers drive very short distances. And I already said that trucks moving very short distances are not the candidates for this automation first. It really is the trucks moving the longer distance. So that is the segment of the labor force in this 200 miles or more. So I take those shares and I apply it to the 1.8 million truck drivers. I say, how many truck drivers are actually in these segments? And so it's not 1.8 million, it's about 300,000, okay, are in these segments moving very long distances where automation would take root first. So I come up with about 300,000, which is much less than the headlines of 3 million and much less than all truck drivers, 1.8 million. And there's other people who have done studies sort of similar, but using different methodological approaches to answer how many trucks are there in these realms. And they also come up with about 300,000. So that's the number I'm sticking with. Um, and then obviously, especially during the last several months, there's been a lot of talk about supply chain difficulties, particularly around this idea of a truck driver shortage. Uh, I put quotes around a truck driver shortage, which is annoying and overly provocative, um, but mainly to hint at the fact that at this point, there probably is a bit of a truck driver shortage, but ever since I've been studying truck driving, they've been talking about a truck driver shortage, and a lot of that isn't, in fact, a shortage at all. So there are segments of the truck driving labor market that have remarkably high turnover, right? And so not every truck driving job is the same, which again is sort of the data bears out, right? Different truck drivers do different things in different environments. 
And so these private carriage truck drivers, like your Walmart truck drivers and others who haul for a specific company, have really low turnover, between 3 and 15% annually. Drivers in what's called less than truckload, um, which are sort of short regional hauls, also have relatively low turnover, historically between 5 and 20%. And this is over the last few decades. The turnover in truckload long haul, again, these drivers that drive really long distances within the transportation warehousing sector has annual turnover rates on the order of 100%. And that doesn't mean that every truck driver leaves their company every year. There's a cadre of people who stay with their companies for a very long period of time, but you get amazing amounts of churn where people stay with a company for three to four months and then quit and go to another company and quit and go to another company and you have a lot of churn. And that turnover, of course, makes a lot of frictional appearance of shortage, right? Which is to say, it's absolutely the case that it's hard for them to retain these drivers um, but generally speaking, again, in you know, sort of the snotty economics way, if you want to avoid that turnover, the most obvious answer is to pay them better or figure out a way to improve their work. Um, and so the interesting thing about long distance truckload trucking, perhaps, is that it's sort of a really great example of a perfectly competitive market. So in principles of economics classes, when we talk about perfectly competitive markets, and then we sort of drop those assumptions. We say, well, that doesn't really hold, that doesn't really hold. A really great market that is in fact perfectly competitive is this segment of the trucking labor market. There are tons of providers of truckload services. Um, they go in and out of business. There's a lot of bankruptcies every year. There's low barriers to entry. Um, and so there's really very low margin. So marginal cost pricing is real in this sector, sort of everything you think of with a perfectly competitive market. Labor costs comprise about 40% of their total cost of doing business and sort of trucks and fuel are the other major costs. Um, and so these companies maintain their position in the market by just running those trucks as many hours as they possibly can. And if you're keeping those trucks moving as many hours as you possibly can, that also means that you're keeping those drivers moving, which means they rarely get home. So they will be out on the road for weeks at a time. They will be pushing the legal limits of the hours of driving because you want that truck to be constantly moving. And so these are not the most desirable jobs. And if they're not the most desirable jobs, companies have two choices, right? They can either pay them more to compensate for the fact that these are not great jobs, or they can take turnover as the cost of doing business. And the fact is, they seem to take turnover as the cost of doing business. So they know there's going to be churn, and they just go with that, right? And that's their trade-off. And sort of, you know, pre-pandemic, I would say that there wasn't much of a shortage. I think post-pandemic, we see sort of systematic, it was mostly just churn, not shortage. I say post-pandemic, if we're looking at, again, this is industry employment, which is not great for measuring all truck drivers, but is pretty good for measuring truck drivers within the trucking industry, which is what we're concerned about. You can see from the red line, the employment dips into the pandemic and is very slowly recovering, but only just got back to its pre-pandemic level. So it may be the case that there are, in fact, many more truck drivers needed than are available. Um, I would say also, however, in the press, they talk about a shortage of warehousing workers. And the warehousing worker line here is sort of the light blue line. And if you track that over time, you'll see that that's at unprecedentedly high levels, right? We've never had warehousing employment higher um, than it's been. The employment situation came out at 8.30 this morning last month. Um, there were additional 10,000 warehousing jobs added. And so the press will still say that there's a shortage of warehousing. Shortage does not mean just, are there enough people to work my second shift job that I don't want to pay particularly high rates um, of wages for? Um, which takes me to the other thing, which is there is truly a shortage. You would expect wages to go up. And so you see here for both um, transportation and warehousing, hourly earnings have been really flat. Um, so while there is considerable churn and while there's talk about not having all the labor you would want, we haven't seen that turn into a situation where wages are increasing, which is what we would expect to see in the market. 
Um, however, it is to say that when we're thinking about automation as a whole, right, this idea that where automation would take root first is also the segment of the market that has the jobs that are the least desirable has a lot of potential upside, right? And so there are ways to sort of think about how this technology could be used to sort of replace these jobs that are not desirable for people to work in, which is sort of these long haul, rarely home type jobs that don't pay a lot of money, right? So there's an economic incentive um, to invest in this type of technology there first, and the technology is best suited for those types of jobs, right? And so there's, you know, the potential upside there. There's still a ton of unanswered questions, right? So if I say, here's the segment where you could use the technology first, we still have to, you know, sort of um, about all of these other questions. So what does that first and last mile look like, right? You're clearly still required to have a person, whether they're helping with the unloading and loading, doing the safety inspections, working on the customer service, what does that look like and who is going to do that work is a really important question um, that doesn't have answers. Who's going to take over those non-driving tasks? A question I like to think about because I think it's fun. I also like to watch a lot of heist movies. So this probably says more about me than anything else is freight theft is a thing. Um, freight theft is remarkably underreported. Uh, and I don't know if people not related to trucking, but rail. So there's been a ton of rail thefts out of LA uh, since the sort of the, the pandemic because the, tr the trains are backed up, right? Which has led a lot of people to go into the rail yards and pop open containers and steal from them. Have you seen the videos on this? Okay, so freight theft is a thing. Freight theft is remarkably underreported, but quite honestly, if the best sort of use of these autonomous vehicles is sort of driving across the middle of America on these restricted, acted, restricted access roads with no one for miles, sort of, there is an incentive there to sort of figure out how to disable these vehicles um, that don't have a person in them and then steal the freight and, and take off with it. So what you're going to do to secure the freight is a thing. There's nothing in the tasks, um, task list from the Occupational Requirements Survey or anything else that says, you know, the nice thing about truck drivers is that they actually protect our freight, but they do, right? They serve that function, right? At night when they park in the truck stops, they look for a safe truck stop, um, safe parking area, and they make sure the freight's okay. The truck driving by itself, if it gets disabled, the freight is at risk and that needs to be sort of considered. And then there's a very complex legal and regulatory environment that nobody's really taken a crack at and Congress has sort of started and stopped multiple times which is to say that the requirements for trucking um, from an hours of service perspective is a federal rule. There are truck safety regulations at a federal level. Truck size and weight is done at the state level. Truck parking is done at the state and local level. There's also additional levels of local regulation on sort of maximum weight on the road, on certain arteries, right? There's a really complex legal and regulatory environment um, that has to be tackled in order for this to have an impact. And all of these things sort of dictate that the impact on the labor market is going to sort of take a long time to emerge. So that's my presentation. And now I have lots of time for questions or comments. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, very great presentation. So I have a question. So I, I really agree that in the sense like all the all the all the all the normal job technology could be great job, but could it also be possible that it can actually help lessen the burden of truck drivers? So instead of like people to like go to truck dusting, so say example right now, the truck is by itself, all you have to do is like doing something that is underrated job of the truck, driving the truck. So now I can sleep and I do it now. So instead of this, this kind of technology, you encourage people to go to be a truck driver instead of a sleep. Yeah, so right, is it going to be labor? Is there a potential for labor complementarity? I think that's right. Um, I think the question then becomes what exactly that person's job description is and how they're paid, right? And I think that is an area that raises a lot of issues. So if really, then the function of the person, because they're not providing the backup, they can in fact be sleeping. If they're doing that customer service, 
the loading, unloading, making sure the freight's safe, um, dealing with any potential safety issues as they're doing inspections, is that still, is that gonna be something that's paid well? But also if the truck can constantly be moving, how do you make sure those people get home, right? So what's the quality of that job, I think is sort of an unanswered question. Um, and then I think the other issue or sort of the complexity there is if you, so if you're dropping that commercial driver's license requirement because they're not driving, who wants, right, who's going to do that job? And I think, right, there's potential upsides to that. Um, in the sort of very competitive environment of um, truckload trucking, are these companies going to be willing to pay the truck driver to continue to drive the truck at a truck driver rate and then also um, be investing in that technology at the same time is, is a concern. So um, your question you know, is good, right? Could it actually make the job of being a truck driver in that segment better? I think the answer is potentially, but it's not clear that they're still gonna be called a truck driver, right? And so what are they called and how are they paid and what does that job look like is a really interesting question. I don't have data on this, but I have a story that there's, there's a company called Your Technology. And I, I, I heard a story from a truck driver. He told me that we have we own his vehicle, uh, the truck itself, but we have a contract with the CRST. And he said that the only can use the platform of CRST. So CRST itself can hold the platform. Like, how much money are you going to pay like a rate for, for you to uh, go with the vehicle <coughs> over the transition? So it sounds to me like they have a monopoly so um, the question was about these um, sort of truckload platforms, right? So these um, platforms that sort of present rates, so load options or load boards, and then drivers can go in and um, accept those loads. The fact is, you would think that there'd be market power in posting those loads, but the fact is these things get bid down. So it, a load either posts to a board or someone signs, a trucking company signs a contract with the shipper to move that load. And so those loads are not particularly profitable and the drivers who pick up those loads um, don't end up doing particularly great in the long run. Um, but you raise another really interesting and important issue. So all of the statistics we have um, on the truck drivers are on employed truck drivers. Um, I, in fact, and nobody does, has a good number on how many truck drivers are owner operators, which are truck drivers who also own their own equipment. Um, and it might range from 10% of the occupation, it might be higher, and it definitely falls under different pockets. And it's problematic that we don't know how many of those truck drivers there are. They tend to, because they're taking the responsibility for their own capital cost, right? Um, they operate as their own businesses, but as you pointed out, most of them don't have the, their own authority, which means they don't actually operate like a little one person owned company. They tend to permanently pick up loads either from the same load board again and again, or from the same carrier. And so um, they really are um, pushed to relatively low margins. That's a good question. So the question is, um, changes for autonomous um, that might be posed for rail or container ship. So I would say that in terms of thinking about the autonomous trucks, particularly in their impact on rail is sort of what I hinted at earlier in the presentation, which is that if autonomous trucks can sort of be running 24 seven with this box freight moving long distances, they in fact become sort of flexible trains, right? That can go almost anywhere. And so you can think of some of that market as pulling that freight away from rail because they can do it faster and more flexibly. Um, and so I think there's opportunity for, for some modal split there. In terms of you know, technology and autonomous vehicles and, and ocean carriage, it's the case that realistically, um, what probably has the most potential to change how we get freight into the country off of these um, big ocean um, container ships is sort of 
automation of the equipment within the terminals themselves when they get to the country. And many countries have very automated marine terminal operation systems. The United States, of course, does not, though the, the technology um, exists there. So um, it's sort of a, a mixed bag that depends on how quickly the technology is adopted in the US. In terms of sort of, you know, the ocean um, ships themselves and the use of autonomous technology to operate those ships. It's the case that um, there is a lot of sort of technology assistance now on container ships that are operating around the world. Um, again, there's a lot of non-technology reasons to have staff on those ships, including um, freight theft and other things um, that happen along the lines. And sort of the unpredictability of weather and how that impacts sort of um, the direction the ships go in and making sure that there's any issues with shipped and cargo, it, it's handled. So that's probably much further off and less of an economic incentive than to replace the labor with the technology. Question? So the question is about sort of timelines. Is it 10 years or 20 years? Um, I think it's within 10 years, but it's not within three, right? So I would say that when we started doing this research um, a few years ago, the headlines were all, you know, these jobs are going away tomorrow, right? And here we are three to four years later, and they're still in this demonstration mode. And I think they're getting closer but really, at this point, the implementation is less the technology. I think the technology is getting very good for, again, the trucks going long haul on restricted access freeways. And you can see those demos. Then the question becomes getting the regulations in place to let this happen. And so you think about, OK, if I want to move something from, say, Southern California, outside of the port area, sort of from the inland desert area, all the way out to Chicago, which currently is a fairly dense rail route. And that's something that you might want to run autonomous trucks on to move the freight faster inland. That's crossing several states, all of whom have different safety regulatory environments, and you have to get all of them on board to make that happen. And so I think at some point it's less the technology that's the limiting factor and more the institutions and regulations that need to scope out how this is going to happen. Yes. So um, the question is about whether the technology is actually moving and focused on the last mile as opposed to the long haul segment. The demonstration. Certainly, it's both. Um, I think, right, there's a lot of research, and I'm not saying that the need is not with the last mile delivery, right? So the question is, where does it get adopted first? The problem with the last mile delivery is that these demonstration projects, right, in heavy, in heavy vehicles, right, are not the urban area delivery, right? Um, that's where it's actually the hardest to implement the technology and probably the hardest to get the regulations as opposed to say the demonstration projects which tend to be in more remote areas on longer stretches of freeways where um, the technology is particularly well suited, right? The technology is still not particularly well suited to navigating Manhattan with its web of pedestrians, cyclists, 
cabs, buses, and all of those things, right? And that's sort of, I think, the holdup. But um, so, you know, I think we, we have a difference of opinion there, but I would say based upon sort of the pilots and where um, the industry's focused in its own investment, it's on the long haul first, not the last mile. Certainly. So again, um, the, the question is sort of centering on what last mile delivery in a fully automated connected level five environment looks like. Um, again, I think we essentially have a difference of opinion about where it's going to be implemented first, what segment of the transportation market and what um, segment operationally. Um, so that's, yeah, again, a, a difference of opinion. And I think time will sort of bear things out. So, so the warehousing has increased. So is the, the benchmark for trying to determine whether there's a labor shortage in trucking the, the, the pre-pandemic or is it slightly, it may be more slightly above where they were previously. So the jobs are still below where they were pre-pandemic. If there was a shift in the demand curve, then the, the demand for truckers is higher than than the pre-pandemic and, and maybe job postings would be the, the way that we could kind of tease out the, the shortage. Sure, no, that's a really good question is whether there has been a sort of systematic shift in the demand for um, truck drivers. I think there's been a systematic shift in the demand for all drivers, right? And so it's not necessarily truck drivers, it could be sort of the, you know, the Amazon van drivers. Um, and whether we could use job postings to tease this out, the, I think the issue is sort of the fact that they're almost always posting for jobs. And so they're still, they're still posting for jobs. Um, and so I would say there's definitely a, sub, a demand side. I would say that there's also this artificial decrease in the supply of truck drivers in key areas where we need them. And so if you think about say truck drayage, we're um, sort of hauling in and out of railheads um, and then in and out of the ports, so much congestion there has basically shrunk your supply of truck drivers artificially because instead of making three moves a day, they're only making two. And at some of the railheads, instead of taking making two moves, right, sort of from one Chicago rail yard to another, which is still sort of trucked across, they're not getting the turns, they're making one. And so what you've really done is effectively decrease the supply. And what can we do there to get that moving faster so we don't really have to think about this disequilibrium between supply and demand. Question? Yes. So say it's a fully automated system. How are the trucking companies going to go about refueling the trucks or recharging the trucks, the electric ones? Are there any ideas or has there been any discussion about that? Sure. So that's sort of um in the unanswered questions realm. And that's a really good point. And it's not, I think it's not just the refueling, it's also the sort of going in for routine safety. So you can think about sort of where the truck goes to get refueled and also do the tire checks and all of those things is going to require an investment in that technology. And then the question becomes who does that, right? Is it the federal government who's giving grants to the states to create these stations essentially? right? What makes it attractive? Where are they located? Um, which is really similar now to thinking about um, the states are working very hard um, with, you know, um, federal monies to think about where should trucks be parking, right? There's not nearly enough truck parking spots, right? Um, but 
you have an incentive problem. There's very little incentive individually for states to use their land to create new truck parking spaces. And I think it's sort of a similar question and it's sort of a to be determined, but it's a really good point. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the potential financial impacts um, on transportation, basically to logistics and transportation costs. And I think that also goes back to that earlier question about sort of, you know, what does a truck driver become and, and what do you pay them, right? At a certain point, it needs to be, it's undoubtedly the case that to get companies to invest in this, there needs to be a financial incentive for them to invest in it. And most of these companies, as we said, operate on very slim margins. Right. Um, and so the sort of individual investment in that capital means the capital cost needs to be at some level that it's financially feasible. But for a lot of these companies, that only comes by reducing their labor costs. Otherwise, costs are going up. Um, and then the question becomes what's the sort of total external cost of this system, right? So you need all the infrastructure that supports this system, right? You need the sensors, you need everything else, you need the fueling stations, you need the safety stops, you need all of these things. Who's paying for that? Where does it go? I think, you know, the potential making a cost neutral to the supply chain as a whole comes from this idea that you can use your capital more efficiently, right? You can keep those vehicles moving essentially all the time, which you can't do with human drivers in them and you shouldn't do with human drivers in them. Um, but there needs to be, you know, sort of this figuring out the cost of the system and then figuring out the cost per mile. But in order to do that, it's gonna have to be very capital, right? The capital needs to be constantly deployed to make it neutral. Um, and I think, you know, there's the historically, there's a problem with getting people to pay for the full cost of a transportation system, right. And so we see that in sort of how we fund the freeways, right, and sort of, you know, fuel taxes and what they're used for, and how we finance that, but even sort of how we finance rail, right. So, a, a, you know, a freight system where we actually try to make the freight providers pay for their full cost, right, their full capital cost, because we can make them pay for the rail lines. What does that look like? Um, there's always sort of this problem with trying to get the transportation provider to absorb all of those costs. And so I would say that either that means the cost goes up to transport, which is probably good because then price reflects the true cost to society, or there's going to have to be subsidies. Question? Right. I mean, I think that becomes the problem, right? How do you ensure that all of these dimensions of this needed service are sort of combined into planning in a way that makes sense? So you don't end up with a situation where a fueling station is here and the maintenance station is over there because there was, you know, a local government or a public private partnership decision to put this there and that there. And now you've introduced more inefficiency into the system, right? There is a role here to have, you know, a very serious conversation about planning out transportation infrastructure more broadly, right? Whether it's the charging stations or the maintenance stations or other fueling stations in a way that makes sense. It applies to the flow of the commodities, right? What's traveling, where it's traveling. Um, and so things aren't sort of randomly placed at inefficient locations, but that probably requires, right? A lot more coordination than we're going to get from this um, far and away. Well, we run out of 